<clears throat> so our opening song this morning, Here We Have Gathered, played by Carrie Day. As we join together in worship this morning, we pause to recognize that the land where we gather has been known for thousands of years as a Miskwachi Waskahagan, meaning Beaver Hills House, a traditional meeting ground and home to many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. In today's world, our church building and our Edmonton community are located on Treaty 6 land. In this wonderful world of online worship, we come together from across Treaty 6 and other places on Turtle Island. Regardless of location, we commit ourselves to the creation of equitable, just, and compassionate relationships with the Indigenous peoples of our home communities. If you are joining us from a distance, we invite you to enter your treaty territory or location in the chat box. Good morning and welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation. I love that sunny green picture of our, of our building. One of many Unitarian Universalist congregations across the continent and around the world. Our words of welcome this morning are from William F. Schultz. Come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and its history warm your soul. Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its vision change your heart. My name is Dean Wood and I'm your service leader this morning. Our speaker is Glynis Lieb and we'll be introducing her later. Our musicians are Carrie Day and Rebecca Patterson. And we thank our musicians and Alara Stefanek Godet and Bill Lee, our techie wizards, for making it possible for us to meet in this virtual space. And we must also remember and thank the volunteers of the music and worship committees who do the behind the scenes work that makes these services possible. As part of our service today, we are going to pause and remember and turn our care and concern to Remembrance Day in advance of the National Day of Records recognition on Thursday. We will light Westwood's compassion candle with thoughts of the individual men and women from all countries who have lost their lives or were harmed by war and conflict. We also think of innocent civilians, women, men and children, 
who have suffered great injustices as the result of war and conflict. I find the following words from Reverend Neil Parker, a military chaplain with the Canadian Forces, to speak to an inclusive understanding of Remembrance Day. At this time of remembrance, O oh God, we give thanks for peacekeepers and pacifists, for those who served on the front lines, and those who protested and marched, for those who volunteered, and those who waited anxiously at home, for those who hoped that things would get better, and those who could not stand by and wait. We give thanks for those who believe that the world could be a better place. We remember those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, trusting that others could and would carry the torch. We give thanks for those who were once enemies and who have now become friends and allies. The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished tradition at Westwood, whether we gather in person or in virtual space. We pause, reflect upon our week and recall the milestones, the joys, concerns and sorrows, the changes in our lives, as well as those who need our healing thoughts. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. In our virtual world today, we can share our joys and concerns by typing them into the chat box at the bottom of the screen. In addition, may you may want to recognize family members and friends in the spirits of Remem Remembrance Day. Carrie will provide a musical background while we light our virtual candles. job and the kids, sun up till sundown, days become weeks, running ourselves ragged, fueled on coffee and homework and lessons and 6 a.m. hockey on the go all the time. Get so lonesome and I want talk 
broken will last like no time is past old stories come back do you I light one final candle for all the joys and concerns that remain unspoken in our hearts today. Please join me in reciting our Westwood affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. While we are meeting in a virtual space without the passing of collection plates, we remember that volunteer service and money are the essential elements that sustain our congregation and Westwood as our church home. We thank everyone who has generously pledged their time and their resources for this church year. During this time of virtual church gatherings, contributions can be made by a check in the mail or by e-transfer. Further information is available by clicking the donate button on the home page. Please sing along with Rebecca as she provides our offertory song. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, from you And now it's time and my, to welcome, and it's my privilege to introduce Glynis Lieb, our speaker for this morning. Glynis is currently the Executive Director of the Institute for Sexual and Minority Studies and Services in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta. Glynis is a social, social psychologist and she has a PhD in that field. And she has worked in community social services for two decades. Her topic this morning is the fight for equity for 2SLGBTQ+, where we have been and where we are and why. Welcome, Glennis. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Dean. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you to my amazing friend, Ilara, for the invite. And it's always a blessing to see Avery too. And that's a thank you both. I'm going to share my screen right now. And uh, if that's all right with you, Ilara taking your screen off. <laughs> Thank you. And so, um, so as Dean said, it's been um, my privilege to um, work for ISMIS, the Institute for Sexual Minority Studies and Services now for about three and a half years. And we're based in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta. And um, we were born of a previous um, doctoral students project about 15 years ago, um, looking at how to build resiliency and self-esteem in queer and trans youth. And, um, and it started out as a summer retreat, weekend retreat before the school year started. So um, queer and trans youth could basically steal themselves for the school year ahead, as, as sad as that sounds. And it was quickly realized that a youth um, weekend retreat wasn't enough. And it expanded into a longer 
camp every summer. And from that, we've expanded into an institute with about seven programs that we run continually, including camps that are now across the country. Uh, we do a lot of work with um, in schools and with youth who have been disenfranchised and are out of school and out of their homes, including a day shelter downtown for homeless and street involved youth. And um, it is 2021 in Canada in, you know, um, in this place that um, that we think is pretty equitable. And we still see children as young as eight years old being um, forcibly evicted from their homes because of perceptions about their sexuality and gender in our city and around. And, and that's a very significant statement to the work that still needs to be done. But recognizing the limited time I have here today, I'm going to talk to you about um, just a little thread in the big conversation about equity for our community. And um, it's something that's become very poignant in the last three years or so. And that is the fact that first and foremost, um, our community is, is not one homogenous group. And we're often painted as such. And um, with that, um, the assumptions are made about the realities um, of our community and the advances that we've made. And our community has made incredible advances in the last number of decades, but those advances have been on the backs of many and appreciated and realized by relatively few in our community. And so we've been having conversations within our community and within our organization about A, the fact that um, there is horrendous inequity across race, gender lines, and even lines of sexual sexuality in, within our community. But also the fact that this conversation about equity and where we're going has been very dominated by Western European conversations and, and, uh, and often presented as if we are the vanguard of understanding sexuality and gender. And part of being humble and recognizing you know, the roles, uh, the roles that we have in advocating for everybody in our community is, um, is reminding ourselves that, that the knowledge we have is not new knowledge. It's knowledge that, um, that we've taken again, largely from members of our community, um, non-white, non-Western European members of our community, um, whose work has largely been taken and without credit and appreciation. And so I'm gonna to start today in the, in the 15 minutes I have, I'm just gonna talk quickly about a really important realization in this conversation about advancing the equity of our community. And I am very grateful to, the, to Westwood Unitarian for um, being a leader in supporting our community. And I appreciate that you're willing to engage in this conversation with me. And I want to also say that this is not something that I am the expert or I am extraordinarily enlightened about. This is a realization in my current and continuing path to self-improvement and doing better by all my community members. And so the thing that often is forgotten in the conversations about advancing our, our rights today is the fact that our community has always been here and has been here around the world. The conversation now is largely, as I said before, it's largely ruled by um, the Western world and Western European world. And we are often presenting these concepts and presenting ourselves as being um, much more advanced in our understanding and acceptance of gender diversity and sexual diversity than other people, other cultures, other places around the world. And we need to recognize that there's a reason that there is so much misunderstanding, so much stigma still attached to gender and sexual diversity. And we need to recognize that the amount of stigma that we see today, even though we are marking it as improving in recent decades, hasn't always existed. There's a reason why we're addressing and need to address this stigma. And the reason is that we, we're presenting concepts as an answer to a problem that we in, in the West have largely created. And I'm gonna come around to that in a minute, but, uh, 
the, when we talk about current concepts of gender and sexuality, you know, we're lar again, we in the West are, the, are proponents of the recognition that we must, I, we must honor multiple sexual orientations. We must honor multiple sexual identities. Sexuality and gender both exist on continua. They're, they're not, you know, um, either ors as has large been, largely been presented for a long period of time in Western teachings and our, and we're not limited to one static identity. So there will be folks who identify as male or female or non-binary. And that and that identity can and flex throughout, um, throughout time based on their existence, how they relate to the world. And we must recognize that. We must also recognize that this, this story is about sexual orientation and the fact that you know, heterosexuality is the norm, homosexuality is a minority. You know, and I know I was taught in school the 90%, 10% rule, um, which had been disproven even in the Western world since the 1950s, but was largely ignored, is also a myth. Right. We must also identify the fact that um, that our gender identity is not linked to our sex assigned at birth and it's also not linked to our sexual orientation. These are different concepts. And these are concepts that are vital components of our sense of self. All these things are true. And this and these are the messages we are trying to uh, trying to relay throughout communities right now and trying to advance understanding and acceptance of. But Again, where have we really come from? Where have we really started? This is not, we're not at the beginning of understanding sexual identity and gender, um, sexual orientation and gender identity. And that what we've done throughout time and throughout colonization around the world is we've oppressed sexual orientations and gender identities that didn't conform to Western Christian beliefs throughout the world. And we've caused immeasurable harm in communities around the world to people who didn't fall within the binary, the male female binary or the heterosexual identity. And that you, there are numerous examples of cultures around the world as far back as we can go that not only recognized but honored gender diversity and sexual diversity and the roles of, of people within communities, including in indigenous cultures here in Canada. And this is, you know, this is a whole other actual three hour talk that, um, that, that we do on just this topic alone. And that for anyone who's interested in learning more about um, sexual and gender diversity throughout history around the world and that too. But these, if we got as far back as we can go and we've done the work, we've done the research and look back thousands of years for um, examples, historical examples of people who identified across the, uh, the continuum for both and found numerous examples, but Again, what has happened through colonization is uh, we have pushed the Western ideals of the gender binary, the fact that, you know, that you must be male or female, um, that gender is the same as sex at, um, assigned at birth, and that heterosexual is the only acceptable um, norm for sexuality. And that so what's important for us to recognize again in our in our quest to be humble and recognize and realize that we have a duty and I say we I'm using the royal we as you know as a, a white colonial settler of European descent, we have a duty to have these conversations and to share this knowledge. But with that, we have a duty to recognize the fact that um, the role that our ancestors have played um, in creating the very oppression that we are now um, trying to lead the way in fighting and painting ourselves as the vanguard of fighting. And so with this, we have to understand a couple of things about about these uh, the current concepts of gender that we have and, and sexuality. And we, might, we have to understand that these concepts are a product of the culture that dominates. And so gen gender is a, is a product, sexuality is a product of it. It is an, and has become an object of the colonial world that we exist in here in Canada. And so it, it 
it dictates how we relate to each other. It dictates how we create power structures, how we decide you know, who is valuable, who is not. And we've created that. We, all, we have to also recognize that this concept of race that we currently have is largely dictated by the Western European world as well. So we're dealing with concepts that, you know, that we have really created and driven the conversations about and driven worldwide ideas about values for and, um, and created this space of oppression that we have to lead the way in fighting our way out of now. And we see that, you know, we see that in, in our work all the time. I mentioned that we have a day shelter downtown for, um, for youth. The youth that we serve are either precariously housed or homeless. Um, they are sex work involved, many of them. Um, and they are, they have been fallen kind of through the cracks of so, um, children's services, etc. A huge number of our participants um, in this project are of Indigenous descent. Many have come from Indigenous communities to the city because they were ostracized in their communities for their sexuality or gender identity and were hoping for better in the city and faced poverty and oppression here as well. But the reasons why they face oppression in their communities are what we have to pay attention to. The fact that so many indigenous communities in this in this land were accepting of gender and sexual diversity historically and now are not tolerant, again, speaks to the influences that we brought with us and the influences of um, how Christianity has been used. And I say how it's been used, and I don't know who it, who in this room consider you know identifies as Christian, but if you do, you recognize that there's a difference between the intent. And, um, and how people weaponize religions around the world. And we've seen a lot of that in this land. And unfortunately, the children that we're working with every day are the product of the weaponization of religion to oppress people. And, and now we're taught, you know, we're providing um, training and support to them and their families and um, trying to offer a quote unquote enlightened view of sexual and gender and diversity to you know to these indigenous youth and their families and you know and every day I'm reminded of you know the part you know the role that you know that we played in creating this problem in the first place this problem of oppression around sexual uh, sexuality and gender lines and so this is you know this is a huge part of this conversation that I think you know I just really want to Im impress upon us all today to recognize that these conversations are complex um, and that we have to understand where they're coming from, what's you know what's motivating them, um, and and redefine I guess redefine how we see our ourselves as leaders in fighting for equity, um, and the and how we see the people that we're often fighting for equity for, and that's been a conversation that has been really illuminated for me over the last number of years, these realizations that often um, those of us who view ourselves as warriors for equity are unintentionally, you know, continuing to oppress the very people that we, that we are um, ostensibly fighting for by seeing ourselves as, as containing the knowledge and wisdom to help advance their needs and advance their status in society while recognizing that everything around us still pay, plays into keeping us at the top of the power structure. I apologize for my dog. <laughs> and that is good. he has impeccable timing. And that so um, in the couple of minutes I have I have left a I just want to bring in a few, a couple of con key concepts that probably will be familiar to many of you, but that, you know, but the true recognition of the complexity of existing in, in this world and this land and this time as, as someone who, you know, as, you know, for, for folks who, um, who fall outside of what is considered, though is not statistically, um, the gender norm, the sexuality norm, and then additionally, um, the folks who are, you know, non-white of non-Christian backgrounds, and that, and the experiences that people that people are still enduring here. We still have incredible inequity and oppression within our community in, you know, um, in this 
space and across the country. And that's up until recently largely been very much ignored. And a, you know, and the assumption has been made that if, you know, again, as I said, if the if um P, if some members of a group are advancing, then everybody is, but also that there's that there's not internal oppression within a group. And we have seen that. We saw that in the cancellation of the Pride Festival um, a few years ago, right before COVID, and rightly so, I will go on record um, as saying very definitively um, that this that we needed a re-examination. Um, of our queer and trans movement in this city and everywhere and how and how it's been dominated by folks like myself and that who get to um, you know who get to disclose um, that you know we fall into this community when it's convenient for us but aren't forced to disclose at any point when it's not comfortable because we can walk down the street incognito and we can enjoy the parties and we can enjoy the fun and then we go back to our, our work and our lives and not and not have anybody whom we don't want to know know um, that we don't fall within the thinly defined you know defined lines of normalcy that we've created for ourselves and so that this this recognition is going to um, should be leading to a few years of being very uncomfortable and I hope it's only a few years before we start to see real movement but it's going to be at least that and we and we see this this now because I think where we've gotten to now is the fact that you know we're talking more about these inequities we're recognizing that they're there um, but we still need to recognize that this, you know, this knowledge and and um, theoretical application of this knowledge is is not enough. You know, in a, in our daily lives, it, we need to look at um, how do the structures that we exist within, you know, our institute, your church, exactly, how do these structures um, uh, reinforce inequities? that were the very inequities that we're trying to fight. At work, we've been going through um, anti-oppression training and with that um, kind of a, a, a forensic um, disassembling of our institution and all our processes from hiring to programming to how we um, seek advice and input for community and that for the last couple of years to look at where these processes basic um, block members of our community and, and ensure continued greater access for certain other members. And we've made a number of changes already along the way and we have we have a lot more to go. We have a lot more learning to go. And I think that, you know, that's where our conversation is at across the board right now. We talk about equity. You know, the focus is not so much on individuals as it is on, you know, on what, you know, what is happening in the systems and structures that we are part of. Uh, and that, that makes it so that even though we say everybody is welcome here, everybody can volunteer, everybody can, you know, nominate themselves for this position, that still we're getting you know, as uh, certain folks who continually do and other folks who continually don't. And it's not enough to say everybody's welcome. You know, I use, always use the analogy of, you know, of um, being not the coolest person, you know, back in high school and, and that and if, you know, and if and I lived in a small town and so some, you know, sometimes this happened, we were a small enough school, sometimes the popular kids would invite you to a party, right? And, um, and that, but if you're not one of the popular kids and the popular kids say, hey, you should come to this party. What are the chances you're gonna show up there by yourself? Because you don't know if it's a setup, you don't know what to expect. You don't know how to behave. You don't know how to dress. You don't know how, how conspicuous you're going to be, right? This, this invitation is not enough. The statements are not enough. And that we have to be um, really thinking about how do we open doors that we can open and then step back and let other people go through and let other people take our seats and and um, the people whose voices deserve to be heard and haven't been heard what do we do what can we give up of the of you know the status the position the you know the comforts that we currently have what can we give up and share um with folks who deserve it and i think that's you know that's where i you know my my work is that's where i see a lot of the you know work i'm also involved in the labor movement and these are conversations that are being had there and need to be had um in that too because we're not, we're seeing a perpetuation of this kind of, you know, of this hierarchy of the, um, you know, the enlightened folk 
who are trying to advocate for other folk, but never stepping back to allow the folk we're advocating for to actually have an equitable seat at the table. And that's where I, you know, that's where I think we need to, to um, work towards. And so I think, you know, a first recognition that I continue to reflect on and continue to learn about is the fact that um, I, you know, I'm a social psychologist. I'm part of the community. I've been an advocate in this community since I was a teenager across a couple of provinces. I run the Institute for Sexual Minority Studies and Services, but I'm not the expert. I'm part of the problem. I'm part of why we're here, you know, um, and I have to recognize that I can be part of the solution too. And I want to be and that, but I have to own um, the, the benefits that I that I enjoy and have enjoyed for a long time that allow me to have had all these opportunities while other folks who are equally deserving have not. And I think, you know, and and um, continue to reflect on that. And the other thing that, you know, we have been learning um, and I have been learning is that conversations about racial inequity um, and other inequities, but particularly racial inequity have to be part of every conversation that we, have that, that those of us who are not marginalized have um, in every day and we're trying very hard to do this within the institute and everything that we do to can continue to come back to these conversations about um you know what we're doing how this works how, did, you know um who wasn't at you know who who wasn't at this table? Why, um, you know, those sort those sorts of conversations. Who are we not seeing? Who are we not hearing from? Um, what have we improved? How's that working? Um, you know, are we seeing a difference in who participates in our programs? Are we seeing a difference in um, who uh, is applying for positions with us as students for jobs, etc.? Are we seeing a difference in who's reaching out to us? Are we seeing a difference in you know who's communicating with us and so forth? If if yes wonderful and moving along, um, it, you know, in areas where not, why, what are we still, you know, what are we, what are we still not doing right? And we're in fact, we're in, embarking on two major projects right now to look at um, that very issue. You know, there's specific members of our community that we're not reaching, we know it, and how, what do we need to do to earn their trust? And so I'm very excited. Both of them are um, multi-provincial projects. One is a national project and, and, so over the next 18 months or so, I look forward to figuring out how we can continue to do better. And, and the last point, again, coming back to sum up the whole conversation here is a continual checking of our prejudices, our ideas about um, you know, the, the order in which history has happened, um, our ideas about our levels of knowledge and understanding. And again, I'm always saying out, us as, you know, uh, again, as somebody of European descent um, versus other folks, um, the judgments we make about other people's apparent intolerances um, and when we view ourselves as more tolerant as them and why and where those judgments come from and understanding where people are at, what people are fighting with. I'm, I've also done um, public education and stigma reduction around mental illness and addiction for a lot of years and that we have a very similar conversation in that room about you know, the, the role that, um, that folks with, you know, with my ancestry have played in the, in the current um, under, you know, shaming and blaming understanding we have of mental illness and addiction and, and um, how we're now leading the conversations about reducing that. But again, recognizing the role that we played in, um, in oppressing people with those experiences in the first place. And that's so, I hope I haven't thoroughly depressed you. <laughs> um, and that, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's our, I think we're at a place now socially where, um, or I think we're, we're getting better at uncomfortable conversations and self-evaluation and we're past just the, um, you know, kind of the, the wearing, wearing the right, you know, the right pins and bracelets and, and um, feeling, you know, and um, feeling self-congratulatory to the point where I think we all, and I've really seen this over the last couple of years, I think we all really want to dig in and really want to change some in things, you know, um, as a, you know, as a per person who, you know, lives with and loves a member of the QT BIPOC community um, and sees every day the different 
difference in how they are treated versus I versus how I am. Um, I desperately want to be part of doing this better. And, um, and that, and I hope you all do too. Uh, any part of this conversation today, we can <laughs> turn into a half day or a full day workshop. We do a ton of um, professional development workshops um, through ISMIS. Um, and so we're happy to connect anytime to have greater conversations, even if it's just, you know, the ABCs of um, talking about gender and sexuality, which I completely skipped over today because we don't have that kind of time, <laughs> but um, happy to talk with um, and provide any more information to anybody. I hope this has been of some use and I'm speaking again in the spirit of, you know, aspiring to um, seek seek justice and equity for um, for everybody who lives in this space with us and um, deserves to be here just as much as I do. So thank you so much. Uh, Dennis, would you have be willing to take a question or two? We do have a few minutes. So uh, I'd suggest that anybody who wants to raise a, a, pose a question, uh, unmute yourself, wave your hand, and we'll try and uh, make sure we spot you. And I do recognize that depending on what questions they are, sometimes this is a sensitive um, conversation sure. for folks and that too. So again, I'm happy to chat privately with anybody or you can reach out by email or phone too. I'll just type that into the chat here. Linus, would you mind taking your screen share down? It would be easier to see people's hands up physically that way. Done and done, my friend. Thanks. There you go. All right, so yeah, now there's definitely a few minutes left if anybody wants to. Avery, I see your hand up. <laughs> Avery. Hi, um, it's been a while since we last spoke, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what to expect in your talk today. And I, I just wanted to say thank you. I feel very seen and very, I'm just, I, so for those of you who don't know, um, I worked at Ismus uh, for a few years before Glynis was hired as director and my experience there was uh, very difficult and very transformative in, in positive and negative ways. But Glynis, I'm just so like this, you've, you have really, it sounds like overhauled the organization. And my question um, is what role do, do the youth have in the direction? And like, um, what lessons do you have or are you learning from youth and young adults in your work? Mm -hmm. Great question. And um, I'm gonna start up by talking about um, you as one of the, the youth who I have. And that's so under our definition of youth, um, Avery and Alara still fall well into that. And, um, and so and um, so I have to say thank you to Avery. And, um, and, um, Avery is, is humble and kind, but um, has been one of the largest influences on um, me learning and growing since I came into Isthmus, even before I met them in person. So, um, so I'd say the youth have a tremendous, um, tremendous role. And one of the things that I, uh, I learned, and I, I started out my career working in, in family and social service as well as in university. And so um, advocating for, um, for children and youth has been a big part of my life. And when I got into the mental, into working in mental health, I, again, we saw that we were we recognize that over, you know, we're talking about some mental illness, you know, the vast majority of people who are ever going to um, experience um, clinical level mental illness have their first experience while they're youth. And yet we were never talking to youth about, about mental health and about being a lead. And so we started it, I started then when I was doing a before is with Isthmus with getting youth into the role of taking a lead and talking about wellness and what they need. And so in Isthmus now, because we largely serve youth through all of our programs, um, we, what we have done is actually ensure that youth play more of an advisory role. So we've, you know, so in everything that we do, um, we have youth who are advisors to our programming. We have a new advisory committee uh, that took the role of kind of the what was the kind of the formal board before the executive board. We have an advisory committee that's made up of community members, and it's largely youth and. Um, from the community and largely um, folks, um, the QT BIPOC folks, so Black, Indigenous, people of color. And um, the other thing that we do is um, 
ensure that we don't take any time and knowledge from our young folk and our non-white folk without um, compensating them for it and making sure that's recognized and that we're um, respecting their time, paying them for the work because it is work. And um, it is, it's work for youth to teach adults <laughs> how to, you know, how to hear them. And, um, and the same for, you know, for black and indigenous and people of color. So, um, so they're taking a huge role. They're taking a lead in everything that we do. We're hiring more more youth um, as well into paid positions and um, trying to prioritize them at all levels. That is amazing. As you can see, I'm very moved by that because that's a, a huge change from a few years ago. So thank you. Yeah, you'll see the composition of the staff look very different now. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. Thank you. No worries. You still have a three minutes if anybody else wants to ask anything of Glennis before we close up our service. And of course, Glennis is gonna stay for coffee too. So That's there's nice. time then as well. Yeah. Yeah, and the, will, the other thing I'll add to that, Avery, is the other thing we've tried to do is also make sure that there's not just one face of the organization, um, you know, and I did, especially didn't want that to be me. Um, and so, um, so what we try to do is ensure that we give, we recognize um, folks different personal expertise and experiences. And so when there's time for, when there's public events, when there's media requests, et cetera, that we're, you know, we're giving different folks um, and that, and particularly, again, the young people that we work with, um, a lot of opportunity to have public voice as well and to be heard and seen. Thank you, Glennis. I think you've provided us with some very broad perspectives and covered a lot of very powerful ground in a very short time. I particularly appreciated your uh, historical and cultural uh, lenses from around the world. And that's something that we don't know, usually know and, 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 and benefits for us from knowing. So thank you so much for being with us today. Your presentation ties into the, the conversations that we're having as a community at this time. So we'll now uh, move to musical meditation, uh, Dona Nobis Passum. Our closing words and chalice extinguishing are again taken from the words of Richard Wagamis in his book, Embers, One Ojibwe's Meditations. From our very first breath, we are in relationship. Within that, with that indrawn draft of air, we become joined to everything that ever was 
is and ever will be. When we exhale, we forge that relationship by virtue of the act of living. Our breath commingles with all breath and we are part of everything. That's the simple fact of things. We are born into a state of relationship and our ceremonies and rituals are guides to lead us deeper into that relationship with all things. Relationships never end, they just change. In believing that lies the freedom to carry compassion, empathy, love, kindness and respect into and through whatever changes. We are made more by that practice. Amen and blessed be. So thank you for joining us this morning.